from Southern Charm to the gas tax increase in South Carolina to transgender rights, Thomas Ravenel speaks exclusively to me for the special edition of Quentin's Close Ups. Thomas. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's been a, a year since I've seen you. Yeah, it has been. 20, uh, June 22nd, 2016, we were sitting right here in your home in downtown Charleston. Upstairs. That's right. And, you know, I've seen the pictures on Instagram and Twitter. Uh -huh. You're going to church and you had the baptism for your one of your daughters. All right. You're in the pool. Yeah. I want to take you back to June 22nd, 2016, because you told me this quote. You have to listen to the inner voice in you. That's God talking to you. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering, what is God talking to you about these days? Yeah, well, he's telling me to uh, do the right thing, and sometimes I want to ignore that voice. You know, it's um, it's easy to do, it, but it's uh, it's hard to do. You know, it's one of those things. Well, this is what I should do, and but I want to do this. Right. I just bought a G wagon, it's a G63, and I asked the salesman. I said, um, Do I need this? And he said, You know, Thomas. What you need is a Honda Civic. It's about what you want. You know, you want certain things, but you need certain things. Right, right. Same thing about what you you should do and what you want to do. And you just have to decide, you know, in, in the long haul, what's best. Not necessarily for me, but for my kids. Yeah. And ultimately for me and for my uh, peace of mind and my own, you know, ability to sleep at night. And, and um, and then yeah, you know, you know, I may complain or you know I really don't do it. But you know, after I do it, I realize you know I'm glad I did that. You know, if I'd have gone and done going out on the boat with my friends, it would just it would have been just another meaningless day. And whereas I find you know spending time with my kids is very fulfilling. So it really it's, it's made me reevaluate my priorities and what's really important. You talk about being with your kids. Mm -hmm. How would you describe Thomas Ravenel as a father? I would, um, you know, it, it'd be self-serving to say a, a great father. I would hope that that um, at the end of the day, you know, um, when I'm, my children are grown, that they're you know thriving, happy adults. Then. I can answer that question, but I told a girl, I met a really nice lady, and um, and I just looked at her, and I just said, you know, you ought to thank your parents. She said, why? I said, because they did one hell of a job raising you. I said, what do you mean? I said, I have a daughter. I said, if my daughter turns out half as good as you do, I'm going to be very proud of myself. And it's like the best compliment you'd ever had. You know, just, just solid, you know, ni really nice person, and you know, she had real strong values, and uh, and she said, you know, parents put her in sports or whatever. I said, no, they work really hard. They put a lot of time in you. Mm -hmm. I mean, a person like you just doesn't materialize out of nowhere. It's just, you know, you're parents that right. put the time and effort and energy. It takes a lot of work to turn out a, a good, happy person. And um, I never really realized the, the sacrifices our parents make on our behalf. Right. You know, we said you know, angry or you know, or so selfish, so self egocentric. Till you have your own child, you just, oh my goodness, you know, I've been a selfish person all my life. You talk about your parents. I know a couple of months ago, his dad just turned ninety. Right. How is he doing right now as we sit here? Oh, he's funny, hilarious. You know, I don't know if you saw him in the last episode, but. I got like a, a thousand tweets. We love your body. He's so funny. Right. He's adorable. He's so cute. <laughs> and I had made the comment, you know, that Catherine was getting the kids that weekend. And I said, you know, no matter how much you love your kids, it's good to have a break. And, right. you know, he came out with this quick quip. He goes, well, when are we getting a break from you? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, you make us all a little nervous, you know. Oh, wow. He said, <laughs> He joked, you know, a good day for him is when he can pick up the paper right. and read it all the way through, and there's no mention of me. <laughs> wow, wow. You know, because the papers, they want to sell paper, any, any kind of controversy. I mean, when I got a head buddy one night, right. and I didn't even press charges, but, you know, they, they did a mean, snarky story about me 
all I did, I was in a VIP section trying to raise money, and and some guy came, comes over and headbutts me. Wow. And I just told the cops, I said, you know, let him sit in jail all night. You know, his girlfriend was crying and pleading with me, and, and um, but they let him go immediately. I said, I wanted him to stay in jail all night and then let him go. Wait. But they couldn't do that, and so I was angry with the cops. So they got the recording of that conversation, and they turned the whole story as a hit job on me. But I was, you know, rightfully the victim and the good guy in that I did not press charges. But if were you to read the story, you would think I was an asshole. But, I mean, that's just, you know. I've been blessed. You know, I'm not going to worry about things like that. Sometimes you just have to you let it go. You talk about the incident that you had with the head buddy. And of course, you know, you have so many people saying negative things about you. Mm -hmm. And uh, talk to me about what's going on. You got banned from a couple of restaurants on King Street. Well, you know what, about 15 years ago, when I ran, I almost went for the U.S. Senate. Right. I was talking to this guy about politics, and the guy well, approached me, and he said, listen, my wife and I are in, sitting in the back, and, and we're overhearing your conversation, and it's ruining my appetite. And then he... So I made some gestures towards it. I was very angry. Right. Maybe I'm thin-skinned like Trump was, and being new to politics, and you know, now I just kind of let it you know, roll off my back like water off a duck's back. But then it turned out he worked at a restaurant and had me banned, but that restaurant owner owned 15 other restaurants. And this is 15 years ago. Right. And I was banned from all the restaurants, and they continue to ban up until this day. And when they buy a new restaurant, I'm still banned. And the guy doesn't even work for the restaurant anymore. Wow. And he insulted me. And so, I mean, that's just... But, you know, I, I, I've been playing polo out in Santa Barbara. Oh, yeah. And I played in, um, in India. It's near Palm Springs. I took my kids out there. Good. And I met this woman. And I was at Cinco de Mayo. And right. she wanted to... She was a fan. I talked to her. I said, what do you do? She said, I'm a nurse. I said, oh, my sister's a nurse. And yet, yeah, went back to the old story about, you know, how we, my brother was in a coma. And it she was a lawyer. She inspired her to become a nurse. And she's an ICU nurse. And she said, you know, my father died when I was six. And I just remember how kind the nurses were to me. And it inspired me to be a nurse. And she was a in the life hospice nurse. And we were talking, I said, you yeah, know, let's get out of here, let's get to all somewhere. And we went to some red room with a red piano, and we just chatted. And I was telling her about my life. I said, all this stuff, it's all so petty. I deal with real issues. People are dying. And all my patients, you know, I try to allow them to die with dignity. And she really put perspective on the whole thing. And it really awakened me to what's important, you know, some person making some snarky comment on social media. Yeah, and that's why I hate social media. You know, somebody with zero information can like or dislike whatever. Um, and there's no boundaries whatsoever. And I find myself getting upset about, why? Who cares? They, they don't know my life. And, you know, I meet people and, and I said, you know, you need to just know me or like some girl said, well, I like you, but my parents, you know, read about you. And I said, oh, that's just, now I'm like, that's just, they don't know me. They don't know who I am. They just read what, you know, these people are trying to get hits on their blog, <laughs> right? You know, they'll, they'll take a positive story and they'll turn it into something totally different. But, um, you know, it's, it's tough. You know, it was tough, but now I just have a different perspective, you know. I'm blessed, like a guy. I have a beautiful home. I mean, people don't know me. I mean, not to sound braggadocious, but you know, Patricia Altshaw, she she wrote this book and she endorsed it over to me. And I, I didn't even look at the endorsement. Wow. But then I went out and read it. I was like, wow, that was very kind of her to say. Right. Because she knows me. Yes. And she wrote, you know, not that this is, a lot of people won't think this is good, but to Thomas, the real star of Southern Charm, love Patricia. And she has, and she wrote in here a lot of nice things about me. I was very touched, and she, she's a very nice woman. But how do you articulate that to those people who dislike you mm -hmm. on social media in person? How do you get uh -huh. Patricia's message out there to those people? 
uh, through venues like yourself. I, mean, I find you you're very balanced. You know, you allow me to talk. And you know, a lot of I did a podcast the other day, and the guy was interrupting me every two seconds. Couldn't really complete a thought. <laughs> you know, they keep wanting to throw the negative narrative in my face and put me on defensive. And when you're on the defensive, if you can allow someone to put you on the defensive, they can. You're then in a position to be pushed around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for take take the chef. Uh, chef's always um, pushing Craig around. And I told Craig, I said, you know, quit getting on the defense. It's like Trump, first debate. You know, you punched at Hillary and she counterpunched and he spent the whole debate defending and explaining. And he learned and he, I said, don't, don't defend or explain, counterpunch. I said, Shep, he go, well, what would you say? I said, well, Shep, why don't you try to run a restaurant without burning it down? Get him on the defensive. Don't explain and apologize. You know, so I, I think it doesn't matter what the apology is. They don't want to hear it. So the best way to handle it is just find out something about them and throw that in their face. Then instead of attacking you, they're defending themselves. Mm. I know it sounds mean, but it's the only effective way in this media, in this <clears throat> electronic media world in which we exist to basically um, fight back. It's a matter of fighting back. But you just really can't take it personally because these people, they don't know you. You know, a lot of times it's, it's, it's envy, you know. And I heard George Will gave a speech and he said, you know, it's one of the seven deadlies where the perpetrator of the sin doesn't gain one bit of pleasure. I mean, think about, you know, lust or, um, you know, what is it, it's only East you know, East gluttony. gluttony, you know, at least you enjoy eating something, but think about envy, do you get any pleasure out of that? But, you know, a lot of people in this country, you know, and we're not an envious nation, right? we're an aspirational people, but so many people engage in that, you know, they see Ravenel, the bridge, nice home, polo, and they just want to hit, you know, I'm an easy target. I got a huge X on my back. But, you know, it's kind of like, who put the song on right now? You know, I, I was listening to a song, um, you know, this guy goes, you know, it's a rap song. Mm -hmm. And I related to it. He said, you know, we ain't got any old money, but we got a whole lot of new money. Mm -hmm. People think it's all old money. I made my own money. Right. It's all new money. I got an old name. But, you know, I went to Atlanta and made my money. I worked my butt off. Went to public schools. Right. You know, went to St. Andrews High School. You know, I didn't get a poor to get out of all these private schools, like all of my siblings. I was the youngest of six kids, and, you know, I came back after I was successful. Okay. And everyone just assumed, you know, he's just born with a silver spoon in his mouth. You know, I used to get up 525 every day, a.m., and, and work till sometimes 3 in the morning. And so I've earned everything. And then I, I got tired, you know, making money is fine, but you know, at some point, enough is enough. That's when I wanted to get back and go into politics. But everything I learned in business is not the right education for politics. You know, tell the truth, be honest, integrity. You know, and the prosecutors, they told me, you know, if you just said, you know, I'm not answering the question, you know, nothing would have happened. But, you know, I was so forthright. You know, and they told my father, yeah, Thomas really spilled the beans on himself. But, you know, everything, you know, like Tim Scott, maybe I should have started like him. You know, he started, you know, county council, how, you know, state, state house of right. representatives. Right. Then U.S. House, and he was born in the U.S. Senate. Right. But I guess Trump turned that process on his head, and he started out at US, for U.S. president and won. But, um, you know, so I wanted to get by. You know, and, and that just, you know, that was bad, you know. I should have just stayed in business, you know, I'm really good at it. You know, our economy's built on divisional labor, specialization. You know, we have an economy where, where you can be stupid and make a lot of money. I mean, you take, take, is that an iPhone? Android. Android, well, I got an iPhone and, you know, the glass is made by Corningware. Right. You know, the microprocess microprocessor is made by Intel. Right. You know, you got all these people, and all they do is one thing, they do it well. You know, and um, 
I was good in business and then I tried something else. You know, that's why you had career politicians who are good at it. And um, they don't get in trouble. You know, like Hillary Clinton, you know, take the fifth, whatever. I'm not answering the question. You know, business, you know, I did repeat. I didn't do one advanced auto parts. I did 50. Why? They trusted me. I didn't do one uh, food line. I did like 18. Yeah, I kept doing all this repeat business because people trusted me. And they didn't have to question the numbers. They didn't have to question X, Y, or Z. And I tried to go into politics and be that way and honest with these people. And, and that spelt my downfall. And then once I was down, everyone started kicking me because when you're down, and your name's robbing and you got money, people just like to kick. But, you know, I don't think I've helped myself with the show because I sort of um, accentuate that per persona just with the, you know, the big personality and... <laughs> I uh, like some Lothario, but you know, you know, as a businessman, I want to help right. probably get the ratings up. Let me talk to you about that because this uh -huh. was the headline in FitzNews.com, and this is on May 10th. Big ratings from Southern Charm. The latest episode of Bravo's TV Southern Charm drew an estimated 1.3 million viewers in this coveted 18 to 14 to 49 demographics according to TV by the numbers. And that's an uptick from the show's fourth season premiere, which netted 1.2 million viewers in the demographic. Mm -hmm. Where did those 1.3 million people come came from? Well, they it really appeals to um, a higher socioeconomic group. I mean, take Honey Boo Boo. They may have six million viewers, but those six million viewers have a disposable income of maybe I I don't have the numbers in my okay. fingertips, but hypothetically, let's say ten million dollars. Well, we may attract fewer viewers, but they may have a trillion dollars and disposable income. So um, <clears throat> there's a lot more advertising dollars. The advertisers are willing to pay for that demographic, right? So, you know, I've heard, you know, through sources that um, NBC Universal has right. made, they've already cleared $50 million profit from the show. Of course, we're not seeing it. But reality TV for these networks is, is a big profit center because they're, they're cheap to make. You know, they may pay a contractor, you know, ours is Haymaker, right. hire and pay them, say, a half million dollars an episode. And then they'll turn that episode and make six or seven million dollars every time they show it, you know. So, maybe I should do a better job of negotiating what I, what I get. But uh, I actually enjoy doing it. Yes. As a matter of fact, I was doing my research just yesterday, mm -hmm. and this particular article stuck out to me. Very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And this is from People.com. The right. headline reads this. Catherine Dennis apologizes for custody battle with Thomas Ravenel and wants to give her ex a big hug. When mm. you hear that, what do you say? <laughs> Maybe like me, she's trying to get the ratings up. I don't know. Yeah, it's been a complicated relationship with her. And, and we're in the gag order, right. you know, uh, court gag order, not to disparage right. the other person. So I'm just going to have to, a friend of mine gave me advice, he's got a couple of sisters, and I said, what if Catherine says X, Y, and Z, and it's all false, and, you know, but I can't engage her, or even tell the truth about her when she's, so he said, you know, this is the way I handle my sisters, when they argue with me, I said, what's that, he goes, I just smile, and wait for the moment to pass. And that's what I did at the last reunion, right. you know, she'd say X, Y, or Z, and I was like, and I'd wait for the moment to pass. It's great advice. Mm. What is different between what this particular season than, the, I guess, past four seasons in your mind? It's a lot less pressurized. You know, the first couple of seasons I felt, you know, the weight of the show was on, were on my shoulders and Catherine's because we were going through real life drama. And it's very stressful. And if you watch this season, I've had people say, you just look better. Because mm. I'm not as just, you know, I slept the night before. I wasn't dealing with so much stress. And it's actually been fun because I'm not even a main character. I'm, I've gotten a lot less screen time. You know, they'll have little snippets of me. And, you know, they've got some storylines that are very, you know, compared with what I was doing three years ago are, are very mild in terms of, you know, uh, stressing me out. Mm -hmm. 
you know, they're funny storylines. They're not real life, lifelong type um, issues. Mm. Let me get to politics because I saw this uh, actually on your uh, Twitter page a couple of days ago, and this is back from May 15th. You said this quote The Dems and MSN are coming off as complete idiots over this Comey firing. Why do you think so? Well, they're, they're the ones who were attacking this guy and going after Comey and saying he caused Hillary the election. Well, Trump fires the guy that was the object of their ire, and they, they're seizing on it as an opportunity to go after Trump, the man who fired him. Seems like they would be happy in a logical world, but of course in, in politics there's no logic. It's, it's completely illogic, illogical for them to attack the man that they were attacking. They're just, it's, they're so obsessed with trying to bring him down that they're going to throw logic aside, throw reason aside, and just seize on some opportunity as if you know, repetition is going to take the place of logic. So yeah. it just, it's, you know, for a thinking person, okay. you think it through, well, wait a second. He's the guy that brought Clinton down, destroyed Clinton, his ill-timed release of all this information, um, and therefore they were calling for his head. Donald Trump fires him, now they're going for Donald Trump's head. Now, tell me, how does that make any sense? For a person who's got an IQ over 50 and has actually thought it through. It just seems absurd to me. Uh, let me talk to you more about that because you talk about logic. I want to go back to April 8th. You said the following on your Twitter page. You said this quote, Rather than presenting evidence of Russian inference into the election, the left attempts to make re repetition do, do the work of logic. Right. When you hear more about Russia, what sticks out to you? Well, Russia, I, you know, we just provoked one of their allies and they're flying jets and moving ships into um, the Mediterranean Sea near Iran and I mean Trump's done things to provoke them. Why would he do that if he's their puppet? None of this makes any sense. You know, uh, Trump's been fairly hawkish towards uh, Russia, but you know, um, he may have said one nice thing about Putin. Putin, Putin, however you pronounce his name. You know, Putin, I'm not saying he's a great guy, but he inherited a mess from Yeltsin, who gave capitalism and democracy a bad name to the Russian people. And he set up the kleptocracy. You know, so people, when they think of democracy and capitalism, you know, there were the government, Yeltsin, was selling national assets to his friends, you know, that for like, I don't know, $500 million, which would later be appraised by Wall Street for $20 billion. So Putin came in and started clawing all this money back for the people and say, okay, let's have true democracy and have a free market and sell it, you know, for these assets for what they're worth. And so he's done some things and, and while we're, we're provoking him all the while in Serbia and, and encroaching on his, um, their sovereignty, and our NGOs overthrew a popularly elected government, and the people wanted to reunite, the Ukraine wanted to reunite with Russia, and we're interfering with a lot of their issues. And so, I'm not saying they're a good guy, but we've done a lot to provoke this country. And so, I don't know that they're interrupting or trying to help Trump at all. Because Trump, you know, from what I've seen, has not been their friend. I don't see the evidence. It doesn't make any sense to me. You know, maybe they did interfere, but I don't see any collusion between Trump or why they wouldn't want to help Trump. I mean, where's the evidence? Where's the smoking gun? I just hear a bunch of talking heads on MSNBC, you know, uh, trying to connect dots that aren't even there. There are a bunch of dots, but they don't connect. You know, here's a dot, but the dot makes, you know, no way it connects back to Trump, and there's no quid pro quo or anything. Um, let me turn to look, uh, really state politics. As you know, Governor McMaster's uh, gas tax veto was actually, uh, increase veto was overridden by the South, by yeah. the House and the Senate, that is, if I can talk. Um, when you think of that, 
What plays in your mind? Because you drive around a lot here in the state of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't mind user fees. My, my big beef is with the income tax. There's nine states that don't have an income tax, and they are thriving. Tennessee, Florida, Nevada, yeah, I think maybe South Dakota. Um, but, you know, Texas has an 8% sales tax, zero income tax. California has an 8% sales tax, 8% income tax. And that's, you know, for example, all the golfers moved to Florida. So South Carolina, in our quest to get the 7% income tax from them, you know, we're getting a goose egg. To get it. We're getting nothing. You know, they're trying to get, oh, that's $10 million to say a year from Tiger Woods if you were, I don't know, if he makes $100 million, 7%, 7 million. But well, we're not getting the $7 million. We're getting a goose egg. But here's what we're losing. We're losing millions of jobs that he creates through property taxes, sales taxes, um, you know, the taxes from the employees, from the jobs that he creates. And so, I mean, trillions of dollars could come into the state and create high paying jobs, really high paying jobs, and those jobs go and these people pay other type taxes like Avalon, but don't tax somebody's income. Or take the capital gains tax. Germany doesn't have a capital gains tax. It's a socialist country. I mean, they're cleverer than we are when it comes to tax policy. A uh, capital gains tax is, is, is optional. Every time they lower it, revenue to the treasury goes up. Every time they raise it, revenue to the treasury goes down. You know, so you need to find an optimal level what the tax should be or have a zero income tax. Let's say you've got all this this money stuck in the buggy and whip industry. And Henry Ford comes along and says, hey, I can create all these jobs with these Model Ts, but he can't get access to the capital because everyone has the money stuck in the in the buggy and whip industry because if they were, are to sell and realize the cap, the, the um, profit, they're going to have to give, say, half of it to the government, hypothetically. So they just leave it there. You take away the capital gains, it, the capital is going to move around more efficiently to those who are going to better utilize it. So with the income tax, it's, it's all about incentives. You know, it gets to a point where you're paying too much, a lot of people just stop working. Mm. Um, and take a look at the lower end. You know, it incentivizes people to stay on the dole. You know, if you start making a certain amount of money, all, the, all your um, benefits are taken away. For example, because of my income, I don't get any child credits or exemptions or any of this stuff. But on the lower end, let's say you're getting all this government assistance, which disappears if you make a certain amount of income. And then you get hit with the taxes. So, you know, we really need to rethink how we collect revenue for the government and I think um, you know a user fee okay that money is earmarked for the roads if you drive the money's going to the roads right. what about people like yourself you take don't you walk or take the bus you know? all day. All day. Walk <laughs> so, so you're not driving you're not paying it you're not paying for gas but you're paying it indirectly if you take a bus but um, you know if you don't use it um, you don't have to pay it so user fees are fine for me, you know. I, I think if they, um, <clears throat> the, the, the taxes, you know, I would focus on reducing would be the income tax. It's 7%, you know, they're reducing it in North Carolina, it's, it's lower in, in uh, Georgia. And we're competing against these states in the southeast. Florida is zero. And you know what, I mean, their coffers are overflowing with money, with a zero income tax. I mean, I've, I've never seen so much wealth in my life in that place. And they don't have any natural resources. They don't have oil. Everyone say, well, they got, in te Texas they have oil and they have all these mill. They don't have any of that in Florida. But there's a ton of money down there. And that's because the money's going there and they're creating jobs. And the state's still collecting it, but through property taxes, sales taxes, what have you. But don't tax somebody's income. So when it comes to taxes, you know, I just have a different take on it. You know, I've done a lot of research. And you know, as you know, Governor McMaster is the new governor of South Carolina after mm -hmm. Nikki Healy became the UN ambassador for the United States. What led agree would you give him as far as job performance right now? Um you know, I'm I do not really following it that much. Okay. You know, I like Henry. You know, I think he's a nice, nice person. 
Um, you know, we all know he came out first for Trump, right. and I think Trump asked him, you know, what do you want? And he said, I, I want to be the governor. And the best way to do that was to appoint Nikki to something. And then, you know, when the government, governor vacates or exceeds a higher office, the lieutenant governor exceeds to the governor's post. So that's how he became governor. When he ran on his ideas, he, he didn't do so well. And, but I don't know that he's pushing any policies. But the thing is, governor of South Carolina, as you well know, has no power. Uh, the most powerful person is uh, Leatherman. He's, Leatherman. He's the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. It was set up that way under um, Pitchfork Ben Tillman in the Constitution of 1899. And it, for racist reasons, they wanted to ensure that were a black man accede to the what, governor's mansion, that he had no power. And the Constitution has not changed. So the governor really doesn't have a lot of power. I mean, his veto was overridden. You know, it, it's sort of a titular position. You know, you got the bully pulpit, but you don't have a lot of powers, Governor, in this state, unfortunately. And you know, you talk about President Donald Trump a lot. What do you like about him when you when you look back at, at his hundred days in office? The one thing I, about Trump, I think he's a, a, a real leader. I think he hires very good people, and he surrounds himself with uh, top top people, and as we know from the apprentice, he doesn't have a problem firing by people, you know, because they're going to make him look good, look bad. And um, and I watched in those debates, they said, you know, well, he just had to beat Hillary. I said, no, he had to beat 17 very formidable Republican candidates. Right. And I saw him on that stage, I knew he was going to win because he just seemed like he was having fun, like he could handle the pressure. You know, and he was funny, you know. This guy's a liar. This guy's a choker. You know, he's kind of a. There was no pressure. You know, and one thing about it, he's not going to be bought off. He's got billions of dollars. You know, he's not beholden to the like the Democrats are beholden to the unions and the Republicans to the Christian right or, you know, the, the big ag Republicans are. You know, that's why we pay twice the rate for sugar in this country because. Republican senators in Florida, you know, they're being financed by the sugar industry, the sugar growers, and the sugar subsidies keep our sugar twice the world rate. And as they say, because it's to protect these jobs, these are low wage jobs, we lose high wage jobs. The candy manufacturers who are going not to Mexico or to China, but they're going to high wage countries like Canada. These are sixty, seventy thousand dollar jobs. And guess what? Coca Cola, instead of using real sugar, they use they substitute with corn syrup, which leads to the widening waistline of your average American. So if you want to get a real Coke, you have to go to a Mexican grocery store. But on a standalone basis, they can do it. They get together with, say, the dairy farmers in the Northeast, Republicans. And they get also get together with, say, um, the wheat farmers or, or the U.S. senators in the Midwest. But they still don't have the vote, so they have to get the Democrats on board because they're gonna, their policies are going to raise prices at the food table by $200. So they tell the Democratic senators, we'll just give your constituents more food stamps to pay the extra money, you know, because the prices are going to be raised. So the average consumer slash taxpayer gets screwed again. This is called log rolling. It happens all the time. They're not going to be able to pay off Trump, you know. And the things I don't like him about him, you know, I'm absolutely for free trade, even if it's unilateral. And I think the wall's crazy. I think we need to go to this Bracero program, which worked in the 50s, you know, where you, um, you certify them, you, um, what's it called, they, um, you document them, you permit them. And in the 50s, you know, it eliminated illegal crossings by 95%. If they found an illegal immigrant, the Border Patrol would merely drive them south of the border, document them, permit them, drop them back off at the fields where they're picking crops or whatever. We have a situation now where they have coyotes, uh, they have to pay coyotes $2,000 and they risk life and limb coming over to this country, and then they don't return. You have tent cities in California. It's just like government. It, it, it makes all these laws to solve these problems you know, purporting to solve certain problems, but they're only making them worse. But you know who's against a Bursero type program, a worker visa program, which Jim DeMint ran on and I ran on in 2004? 
the Democrats, because the unions don't want the Mexicans, because they think they may compete against high school dropouts. And so it's the Democrats, and then on the higher end, the H-1B visas, we educate the smartest people in the world. People like Sergey Brin, he's sort of Google, you know, Russian immigrant. And we only have, I think, the limits at 70,000. Only 13,000 actually work. The rest are dependents or spouses. Bill Gates did a study. Each one of these guys we kick out of the country, after we educated them, the most brilliant people in the world, they could have created five jobs. That's why he started a plant just north of Seattle in Vancouver and educates these people that are benefiting the economy of Canada. It's absolutely absurd, our immigration policy. And they think a wall is going to solve it? Well, look what happened in Manchester. I mean, they have something better than a wall. It's called a moat. The moat is the Atlantic Ocean. That's better than any 12-foot wall, which is just going to create a, a, a demand for 13-foot fences. You know. So I, I think all the wall, you know, it's a, that's the one thing about Trump. He's a little shameless in his demagoguery and his populism, saying what people want to hear. And I think it won over a lot of disaffected um, blue-collar workers in these um, blue states like Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania. And when I saw the states started going red, I knew, I knew he had it because he was talking to these people. But a lot of these nationalist type policies, anti-global, making the globalism, you know, the, the straw man that you want to knock down. Because some people lose jobs, you know. Strumper, he's a very uh, famous Swedish um, economist, he talked about creative destruction. You know, for example, the ATM machine put 200,000 people out of, out of work, tellers, people that, you know, I want to cash a check, right. or what, I need, I need cash, you know, take money out of my account. Just go up to a machine and does it, you know. That put a lot of people out of work. Our, our PBXs, we have operators, and right. now, now you call, you hit one to get Thomas driving it, or you hit 16 to get Thomas driving it. Well, we don't have someone answering phones, and you walk in, and you get all these messages, you know. You just hit your thing, you get all your mess. That's called creative destruction, but, it, but what happens is it saves companies money so that they can then plow that money into higher paying jobs and it creates a better uh, um, way of life for everyone. You know, you know, people want to bash capitalism back at the turn of the century. The government does statistics. People would spend nine hours washing clothes. And women, they'd have to walk over a mile. You, know, you have to go boil the water, you do all this, you a washboard. Now you just, because of capitalism, you throw it in a washing machine and you know, some of these machines, you, you get an email off your, off your cell phone, your, your laundry's done, right. you know. And people want to bash that, you just save nine hours. It's crazy. So what's next for you? I mean, write the headline, Thomas Ravenel will do what next? Just do a good job of raising these guys. I want to sell this house. I've right. spent two years renovating this house, but this house is a death trap. People are attacking me because I don't have my kids living in the front house. I have four stories, these stairs and all. It's not healthy for kids. It's not kid friendly. You know, I thought I was protecting them. You know, it's a compound that's surrounded by a you know, 10 foot wall. Right. But I want to be in a kid friendly neighborhood. You know, and we're in Halston Village, very right. low. I think we're below sea level. Right. But, you know, so if you want to put in a pool, the way they get around it is they, they apply for fountains. And I've got several fountains out there. but. The thing is, I want to be in a, a kid-friendly neighborhood, you know, have a sandbox, a swing set, yeah, yeah. maybe a club pool. I was thinking about not getting an aisle, but maybe the neighborhood next door to it. And there's interconnectivity where you can just drive in. And, or even my own pool, but you know, it's nice to go to a club pool where there are other kids. Even if they don't play directly with other kids, they, they I do what it's called parallel play. So, um... You know, that's what I want to do. I want to get my kids in an area where, you know, they're not looking to me to interact all the time, but they're outside in the yard, you know, fenced in safe yard in a safe neighborhood, and they're playing in the sandbox, swinging, and, you know, uh, when we were, I rented a place out in California and had a nice pool. We, we had a woman who would come over and teach the kids how to swim. So, I mean, that's my main focus is, you know, Paying my taxes. <laughs> Gotta pay your tax, I don't wanna go back to prison, you know. But, and, um, you know, just being a good citizen, you know, making people laugh on the show. And, um, 
you know, and I'll write op-eds, you know, I'm a big promoter right. of equal rights, civil rights, you know, whether it's for tra transgenders or, you know, I think the drug war, you know, unfairly um, harms people of color. You know, they go after the voiceless, you know, because they, they go to the college campuses, you know, kids, you know, white kids, affluent kids, they're doing drugs far more than people in the inner city. But they don't go after those people because they know they have contacts with senators and congressmen and judges. They do that, the police department knows they're going to start getting their budget cut. So they go after the voiceless. Some kid, and they say they want to protect, you know, um, the kids. Well, three national surveys said kids have far easier access to the illegal drugs because the kid selling drugs at the street corner, he didn't check in IDs. Not only that, you get rid of the drug war, he's not going to be on the street. He's going to be in school getting a diploma and getting a real job. And 80% of the people who die from illegal drugs would not die were they legal because there's no quality control. Just like back during the 20s, every goal they set, the opposite occurred. All the drive-by shootings, 20,000 drug gangs, all this violence spilling over the border. Now this guy Sessions, he wants to double down on his failed policy. I mean, say what you will about the teetotalers, but they passed a, con a constitutional amendment. The only one that's ever been repealed, it was so stupid. But we're doing it right now, and we didn't even pass a constitutional amendment. And we incarcerate, we have 5% of the world's population, incarcerating 25% of the world's population. With 5%, are we five times more evil than the rest of the world? And with these ignominious incarceration rates, are we safer? No. We're the 89th safest country in the world. Canada and other countries, um, Canada's like the seventh. I think Japan is eighth. I'm not, don't have the numbers at my fingertips. It's a completely failed system. But it's just good politics. You know, nobody wants to talk about it. And you know what? It affects people of color. I mean, why would this guy, William Henry Gates, he's a Harvard professor, he's accessing his own home. Why would he say why? Because I'm a black man in America? You get rid of the drug war and you know, a story like that is going to be antique. You know, it's, should they, you know, you ask an African American, racism still exists. Even though we had a, an African American president. You can start ticking off the seconds and say, yeah, I mean, why? The drug war. That, you know, the way they unfairly prosecute this drug war. It's like um, Richard Pryor said, you know, the comedian said, where's the justice? All I see is just us. So, you know, I'm a big promoter on that. You know, with respect to the transgender situation. You know, these hostile voices on the right, Christian right, they have a problem. Why don't they talk to God? these people's creator. Take it out with them. They want to attack these, these human beings for how God made them. So these are just some of these issues that I'm passionate about. You know, I write about it and I put it out there. And um, that being a good father, I want to find, you know, um, a good partner. You know, I've always treated my personal life separate from my business life. I've been successful in business. Right. I saw a therapist and she said, Thomas, treat your personal life like, like your business. You're looking for a partner in the business of life. And my father even said it, you know, because I broke up with this really nice girl and, and I said, well, the romance is, you know, kind of done. He said, he just looked at me like he was an idiot. He said, all that heavy breathing, all that, it just goes away. You want somebody you know, that shares your values, who's committed, who's not selfish. When you have kids, you can't be selfish. You know, like, I was talking to this nurse, you know, she's, she's a giver. I mean, she's dealing with end-of-life situations, very selfless, you know, just, you know, you know get somebody who wants the same things you want, and you go down, you know, you don't want someone going in that direction, you're going this way, you're running for U.S. Senate, you're trying to do all these policies, and they want to go, party till the next day, all day long, doing things that you shouldn't be doing. But, you know, where to send the kids to school, where you want to live, I mean, these are all business type decisions. Selling this house, is business. I got someone coming at 2 o'clock to look right. at it. 
you know, I need to treat it more like, you know, it's like hiring somebody. You know, um, people say, you know, how do you hire someone? You know, do you go over the resume? But no. They wouldn't be sitting in my office if their resume wasn't good. You know, didn't check out. They got all the skills, qualifications, and they're sitting in the office of my desk. You know what we're talking about? Everything and nothing at all. You know, how fast can the G Wagon go from zero to 50? You know, I want to see if I can get along with this person because I'm going to be spending a ton of time. I hired this one woman. She was a project manager at Harvard. She went to Harvard. It's brilliant. I could not work with this person. Wow. You know, it, it was horrible. And I had to get rid of this person. Well, she actually quit because she saw the writing on the wall, but um, you want to. You know, I want to work with people I can get along with. You know, so getting along with somebody, that's business. How are you going to do business if you're with someone you can't get along with, right? So, you know, I've started to look at it that way. And I just yeah, want good, solid people. You know, I talked to a friend of mine, and he said, What, there's two kind of women. It's like, he said, My wife, I'll go out of town for five days. I don't even have to think about it. She locks up that door, you know, you don't have to worry about coming home and you know, hear that, hear a bed going, eh, 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 you know, she ain't, she ain't messing with the pool boy, okay? He, he said, there's no in between. And, yeah, you know, he's a smart, smart guy. He likes to have fun and all that, but when he came down, he said, and he said it on the show, you know, you got to be very choosy. Mm -hmm. Very choosy. That's your, that's your life's partner. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I just kind of took it off of grand. I kind of bought in this Hollywood thing, and it's just, you know, I'm not blaming my problems on, on you know, relationships, but um, I think Catherine said it in the last show, you know, I didn't feel worthy, you know, I had a Down syndrome brother, and he got all this love, and I didn't really think I was worthy of a really good woman. And I, I think I, I sold myself short in a lot of situations, and, um, I, you know, my goal is I, I want to share my life with somebody. You know, and I want it to be that's almost solid. Or I, I don't want to be Andre Bauer always said, you know, I'd rather be alone than wish I were alone. I don't want to be in this horrible situation where, you know, you're paying lawyers all this money every month, you know, and it's just ridiculous. That's bad business. Well, uh, Thomas Ravenel, thank you so much for this interview. I really appreciate this. Yeah. <laughs> Take some twists and turns we weren't expecting. Oh, well, it's an interview. <laughs> Thank you. All right, appreciate it. I appreciate it. Okay.